Thank you. Um, wow, that's loud. Okay, so as has been said, my name is Honza. I'm here hoping that everybody has a good conference. And I'm here to talk about observability and what that is and why you should care and what are some of the best practices and tips and to get you started, essentially. Uh, so what is this talk about? This talk, about, uh, this talk is about, I wrote some code. It's running locally, it's running just fine, and that's not what we're concerned with. What we're concerned with is how to make sure that co it continues running fa uh, fine when it's not running on my machine in front of my eyes. Uh, how do I make sure that that happens? Because on localhost, when we develop, we're used to all kinds of different tools. We have tests, we have uh, profilers, debuggers, all of these things. I mean, if you want to see something cool, I'm sure you've seen the colo stand just outside this room, which sort of highlights what you can do locally, how you can make your developer experience very good. But once you move into production, it doesn't really uh, work, those tools, anymore. They go away because they are not built for that. They require a lot of extra, extra effort on the code point uh, so that it's not really efficient or feasible to run them in production. So what do we do now? Well, obviously, uh, for many people, the first impulse is, like, we can just connect to the server, right? Please don't. Uh, so first of all, please don't, but second of all, sometimes that's clearly not an option because you might not have one server but multiple, or you might be running entirely serverless, meaning on a server that you don't have access to. Uh, so clearly that's not, an, that's not an option. But we still need our questions answered. And that's really what observability is all about, answering questions. We'll go through a few of the crucial questions now that really are kind of important for, for us all that run any code in, in production. Uh, but first, a few disclaimers. I'm going to be using uh, the Elastic Stack as, as an example of how this works. There are many other tools. I'll go through them uh, towards the end. I'm, I'm just using Elastic because I spent a significant chunk of my life at that, at that company. And it was just the easiest for me to choose, and it's still free and open. Uh, so I don't, have to, I don't have to pay anything. But moving on to the questions, as promised. The first, most important question is, like, is it working? Is it even up? Uh, can my customers, my users, get to the code? And is it, is it still available? And this might sound like a simple question. It has a yes or no answer. But there are more nuances to it. Like, is the server up? Is the web server up? Is the application up? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Those are all different kinds of questions that are kind of part of this wider is it working question, but require different tools, different approaches. Even just to test whether people can access that server that can have many different implementations, many different answers. I mean, is the server accessible locally from within the same data center can be completely different from is it accessible from uh, users' homes, from where users are. So always, when you think about this question, uh, you need to ask yourself first, what does that mean for my application? Is it only an internal application, let's say an API for other services in the same data center? If so, then you're fine just checking it, checking it locally. But if this is a publicly available service for, uh, for other people, you have to check from where your users are, whatever that might mean, different data centers, different continents, other things. And you might also want to share that information with them. Anybody knows what this page is? GitHub status page. And this is, uh, I, I have it here as, an, as a reminder that this is an information that's not just useful to you, but obviously useful to your users as well, uh, where they want to know, like, is, it, is the problem on their side or on your side? I'm sure you've all been on the receiving end of this situation where you're trying to use a service, it doesn't work. And now, like, is it, is it them? Is it me? 
Who knows? Well, the, hopefully the status page knows. And it will, it will be able to sort of short circuit this, uh, this conversation, this internal monologue that you might have. So that's the, to me, this is the ultimate answer to the first question, if it is working. If you can put together enough information to display a page like that, that displays not only if the service is available, but each and every individual function on the high level, whether it still performs, whether I can still create a repository, whether I can push, whether I can uh, create an issue, those are different things where that question still makes sense. Is it working? So uh, that's, that's the first question answered. Somewhat. The second question is, what is it actually doing? I, I mean, I know it's up, I know it's there, uh, but what is it, how is it spending its time and, and what is it doing? Locally, when I do this, I don't know about you, but I'm a huge fan of print statements, well, print functions now, uh, which tell me exactly like where in the code things are. Uh, in, in production, uh, we use prints as well, but we just call it logging. It's sort of the, the prints that are considered okay. Uh, but realistically, it's the same thing. It's just a piece of code saying, hey, I'm here. This is what I'm doing right now. And uh, that's pretty much it. Except if you just uh, do that, then you get lost super quickly. You're faced with a wall of text and that you have mixed things from different, from different transactions all together, et cetera. This is the simplest possible log. This is just log from an Nginx web server, so just HTTP requests. But what you need to realize that in logging in production, the, the experience is different than locally. Locally, you're the only user. When you see your, your print statements, uh, they are usually represented from a single transaction, so you can see how one thing follows another. In this particular case, you would have things intermingled from different transactions, etc. So it's no longer useful for human consumption. You need something to make sense of those, of those logs. And first, we need to sort of add some additional con uh, context to the, to the logs. So first actual tip, struct log, uh, is a Python is a Python library that uh, allows you to have some structure in your logs. I assume it has something to do with the name. Uh, and this is uh, something that allows you to say uh, this is this is a message that I want to display to the potential unfortunate human who is reading the the log. But these are all the structured information, the context of it. And you can go a step further and have a, f like a function like this. This is my real code that I use that I uh, call from a middleware. Every time there is a, there is a user logged in, I just, I just call this piece of code and it makes sure that every single log statement that happens during that transaction will be annotated with the user ID, user email, and all of these things. That way, when an angry user starts yelling at me, I know why. Because I can, I can filter through the logs and directly search for their, for their email or their user ID and see exactly what kind of experience they're getting and, and know where the problem might be, at least where I can start debugging. And I can take it one step further, which is to uh, sort of break down the individual log message and even a simple log message like what I saw, uh, what I showed earlier, uh, the records from uh, HTTP uh, server, there is a lot of hidden structure in there. For example, uh, I assume most people here have seen the user agent string that browsers send. It's a piece of madness. I don't, I, I don't know why. I'm very sure many people here know why, but most of them say it's Mozilla, but it's not. And, and you don't really know how to interpret that, at least if you're anything like me. So instead, what you do is you throw a piece of code at it that will let it parse. And, and here you have a structured information that this was a request made from a Mac on Chrome, and even the version of it, which is super important if you want to track down a specific issue. 
So that's the, that's the crucial lesson here. Always look for the structure. Many times when people do logging, they go from the structure into an unstructured text. Because in your code, you have the structure, you have the variables, you have different counters, you have information about what you're doing. And then you compose a very nice log message for yourself containing that, that structure. But that, the structure is lost because it's readable for a human, but a human can only read one message at a time. That's not what we're after here. So use something that will allow you to preserve that structure. Struct log for Python, but there are many other approaches. And make sure that that structure doesn't get lost in, in time. So that uh, configure struct log to log the data in JSON or some other structured format so that you don't have to keep you know, serializing it into string and then parsing it back. That's a waste of effort for both you and the CPU. And finally, once you have that structure, you can do things like that. You can, you can throw it in a tool that can, that can work with that, visualize it, whether it's uh, you know, a, a Jupyter Notebook or, in this case, Kibana, part of the Elastic Stack. And this is purely the visualizations of the data that we've seen before, the HTTP requests. But we see where they're coming from because they contain an IP address, which we can look up in a GeoIP database. Uh, it contains the information about how many requests, whether they were successful or not. And this allows you to sort of translate the wall of text into images because as humans, we're very good at processing images. We are very bad at processing walls of text. So that's the, that's the exercise here. Uh, preserve the structure so that you can get your images instead of a wall of text and can get something useful out of it. Like in this case, you can immediately, everybody here can kind of noti uh, notice a few suspicious things. There are a few spikes here and there. And you can see it immediately. I don't have to tell you even, even where to look. That's super nice. That's what we're after here, to make it easily digestible for people. So that was the question of what is it doing? And here we're kind of getting into, into the other question, which is, how is it doing? So sort of uh, quantifying, how is it doing? How many requests is it doing? How fast are the requests? What is the 99th percentile? So, meaning, what is the experience that 99% of the people have? And for me, this is the, this is the least interesting, interesting part of observability because if you need it, you have it. Uh, it usually is only interesting at scale uh, because otherwise, you don't really care that much and the other tools that we're talking about are more interesting because they give you more targeted information. For the metrics, you usually get pretty graphs like these and you have many, many pre-built tools that can already collect and visualize these informations for you. Uh, for example, here this is just information from, collected from a base system, just from a running Linux server. So it just contains generic information about memory and network and CPU and, and things like that. It is definitely useful, but it doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything specific. It just tells you that there might be some issue or that there might be something, something suspicious. But it is, by its definition, generic. You can get more specific with it, and the more specific you get, the, the more value you get out of it. So if you go from uh, monitoring the system to monitoring uh, the, the web server, you get more targeted information. Suddenly, you just don't see that you have uh, too much CPU load. You see that requests are getting slower. That's a much better information, of course. Uh, if you go one step further and uh, let's say, monitor the, the database or the, or the web framework that you're using. I wonder what web framework people here use. Uh, then you might get even more targeted information. And that kind of leads, the sequence leads to sort of leaving metrics behind a little bit and moving to sort of the kind of the ultimate in observability, which is APM, Application Performance Monitoring. That's actually unwrapping the black box that is your code 
and looking inside and seeing what is it doing. What is it doing well and what is it doing wrong. That's the most important part oftentimes. So uh, unlike the other sort of mechanics that I've talked to about uh, until now, this is something that requires you changing the code a little bit, essentially instrumenting the code, installing something in your code that will kind of sit there and observe what, uh, what everything, what your code is doing. What is it talking to? Uh, what responses is it getting, etc. This is where a lot of people get very uncomfortable for some reasons when you start sort of thinking about it, how this works. And the answer of how this works, particularly in Python, it's just monkey patching all the way down. You install something in your, in your code, you configure it, and suddenly it will monkey patch all the known APIs, all the known libraries that it knows about, like Django, like requests. So if you do a, an HTTP request with requests, it will automatically be captured. Or Psycho PG2 when you talk to, talk to Postgres. That's something that makes some people uncomfortable, but it is super useful and it is sort of, it is definitely, definitely worth it because what it gives you in kind of the first instance is something like this, a simple visualization of what your transaction looks like. A transaction might be anything from a, a HTTP request to this, for example, is a salary task. So, so a background worker that woke up, did a task, and, and managed to accomplish something. And we see a few things here. We see that it was a successful transaction, go us. Uh, but we also see something very suspicious. I don't, I don't think that uh, you, can, you can read that. So just the first blue bar, it's longer than all the others. All of the blue bars in this case are, are me talking to, talking to a database. And I included this screenshot because this was actually super useful for me because the first bar is just connecting to the database. It takes me 26 milliseconds to connect to the database and then all the requests are fractions of that. That's very actionable information. That's something that, that's easy to fix. You just use persistent connections and you make sure that the connection is initialized before, before you run. But it would be very hard to see without something like this. I would say almost impossible unless you knew specifically what you were, what you were looking for. So this is kind of the, the, the quick win that you, can, that you can get. And of course, uh, once, you, once you start co collecting this kind of data, you can take it one step further. Did you ever wonder what is the distribution of the time spent between your code and Django code and, and the database? Well, since we have all of this information, we can easily answer that question because we, we kind of know uh, which part of the stack Django is responsible for. Uh, we know all of your requests to the, to the database or to third-party APIs or something else. For example, here you can see I'm talking to S3. I'm doing some requests over HTTP to other APIs. And here I see a breakdown of where, I, where my application, where my server spends its time. Is it running my code? Is it running Django code? Is it just talking to, waiting for a database to do its thing? And this is why I didn't spend a lot of time talking about metrics, but instead sped up for the APM because this is the kind of numbers, this is the kind of metrics that you can get when you have a piece of monitoring, a piece of observability that understands your code, that sits inside your code and has this kind of insights. Uh, so super useful and you can already see how this might be, how this might be actionable because you know that if it spends 90% of its time in the, in the database or talking to third-party APIs, there is no point in optimizing the Django code. There is no point in optimizing the Python outside of just looking at what, what are the requests that it's making and whether it's uh, possible to optimize those. So it's uh, immediately uh, sort of visible. And you can take it one step further. Nowadays, to 
disappointment for some, uh, web applications are no longer just simple, you know, request response, server static HTML, call it a day. We have, we have application code running in, in the browser as well, and that's just when we're talking about web applications. If we're talking about other things, it gets even more complex. So what you want to do there is you want to monitor start to end the entire journey of the, of the transaction, where it starts on the, on, in the browser, what the browser does, uh, the, the resources it, it needs to load, the rendering it needs to do, and then what, are, what is the code in the browser doing. And if you then connect it, you have a graph like this, where you see the entire transaction uh, in the browser. And you can see the API calls that it's making to your server. And you can see it all in one, uh, one picture. This is called distributed tracing. And, and for anybody interested, the way it's done is it just injects special HTTP header. The, 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 the code that monkey patches everything just puts in a little HTTP header to all the outgoing requests and looks for the header in all incoming requests and then uses it to correlate uh, these, different, these different transactions into an overarching trace. Uh, so here you see some front-end code um, running in the browser, reaching out to the back-end API, the back-end API talking to the database, and you see all of that from, from start to finish. And here again you can see that there are some information that would be very hard to get otherwise. For example, from the point of view of the front-end code, the transaction took, let's say, 100 milliseconds, the call to the backend API. But what was visible in, on the backend API, what we thought how fast we did it, was just 40 milliseconds. So where did the rest go? Any guesses? Network, yes. I, I don't know about you people, but I am always surprised that networks are not instantaneous. It, it really, it's, it's unfortunately, I, I wish that was a joke, but no, every time I realize that, that really there, I need to account for that, and it's, you know, it's not just what I see uh, other people see. It takes a while to adjust to it. And something like this, something like this helps. So this is sort of the, the ultimate in what I would say the, the observability. You can see exactly what's happening from start to finish. You can see what, uh, what, um, experience your customers have and you can also if you do your logging right if you uh, if you remember I had a slide there saying context is king so if you take this trace ID that ties all of these all of these different transactions together and include them in your in your logs as well then you can easily say okay I see this transaction I don't like something in there show me all the logs associated with these transactions from any from any layer and you can and you can see that and start and start debugging or if you're less lucky you might have to start debugging earlier because something goes wrong so what happens when when the code fails and and you're not there looking at it well, that's where sort of error tracking comes, uh, comes into play. That's the standard uh, part of any application performance monitoring. There are some services that, that uh, specialize in it. If you've drunk coffee here, you might, you might know. We'll talk about it later. Um, and it's kind of, again, the one case where you have, you have very good experience with errors when, when you encounter them locally because you have the Django debug view, uh, you, have, you have the excellent trace back there, you see the value of all the variables. Uh, in production, you can get that too. That's part of what this, is, what this is about, where you see the trace back, you can see where that error originated and what were potentially the values of the variables there. So the idea here is, again, to replicate the experience that you're used to from localhost the, the developer experience that allows you to, to develop the code in the first place and make sure that you can use that after you've moved to production as well and you no longer have physical access 
to to the environment and you're no longer the first uh, the only user because there might be people who have different experiences different setups etc and it's impossible for you to always try to replicate it blindly you need something to catch that error for you and give you as much information as as possible so those are all the key components of a good observability system uh, so uh, just to just to sum it up the best uh, kind of experience that you can get from this is if you have a single system that does all of these things for you. Uh, so the logs, the metrics, the, the APM, because it allows you to switch between them and, and, see, and do exactly what I described, which is I see an error. Give me all the log messages that were associated with that transaction and show me the APM data, show me the spans, show me the, the, the calls that that code made. Before, before, it, before it exploded. And that sort of multiplies the overall benefit that you get from these systems. Because if you have to open one page to look at the metrics and another page to look at the logs and a third page for the APM, again, as humans, it's very hard to connect this and it's just manual labor that nobody wants to do. That's why we invented computers in the first place, to get rid of tasks like these, make use of it. And finally, don't stop with, uh, with just the technical data. I talked uh, uh, ab about context a few times, how you should, uh, for example, track which user it was. But it can, go a, it can go a step further, which is tie it to your, tie it to your business data. You can actually use the same system to answer some business questions. That's, that's the first thing. Like if you, if you, let's say, run a magazine website or a newspaper, you can easily annotate all of the transaction with like, what article were the people reading? Who is the author of that article? And you can immediately, from the same visualizations that you can use to display which is the most popular browser, you can immediately answer the question, who is your most popular author? What are the topics that people are interested in right now? It doesn't have to all be technical. Because uh, on the technical side, it's all just data. It's just different annotations, different dimensions of your data that you might want to slice and dice as you wish. OK, now quickly, let's just run through the specifics. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm doing this using Elasticsearch because it was just the default for me. Except for the uptime, I just use status cake. I, I don't know anything about them. It just worked. I, I, it was part of a blog post that I read to, to set it up. I ran it, it worked. I never looked at it twice. I don't care about those, those things because it just works. It's a very simple question, yes or no. They send me an email if it doesn't work. Awesome, moving on. Uh, for logging, I just use FileBeat, a small open source agent written in Go that sits on, uh, sits on my server, reads the JSON log file that's produced by structlog and ships it over to, uh, to Elasticsearch. And I also have uh, some pre-built modules that came with it, notably the Nginx and, and system modules. And I use Elastic APM as well. It ha they have support for Python. They have support for Django. They have support for React. So all of the things that I needed came out of the box. And this is what it, what it costs me to run this system for a small deployment, for a single server where everything is, everything is set up. Word of warning, the two hours is actually correct, but I've been doing this exact thing with Elasticsearch for six years straight for a living. So there might be different, this is the theoretical sort of optimal time for implementation. It just, it is possible. Uh, but obviously, your mileage may vary. Uh, if you have any questions, like any specific questions with your deployment or need any help, I'll be around. Just grab me. I'll be happy to help and try to get you closer to the two hours. But I'm just saying it is possible. And what are the, what are the other, other solutions out there uh, if, if, um, 
you're not specifically tied to to the Elastic Stack. So first of all, there are two uh, there are two uh, open source cloud native initiatives, Open Tracing, which was later folded into Open Telemetry, which is a set of essentially standards and tools to implement all of these. And then there are different different tools out there. Uh, so Sentry is the is one of the best known ones for uh, for Python. They do the APM, they do the error tracking really well. Uh, they pay for coffee. What's not to like? Uh, and then there are other most of these. Uh, so Sentry you can host yourself. Elastic you can host yourself. All the relevant parts are open source. For a lot of these others, it's just services that you just pay for instead of setting it up and running it running it yourself. And obviously, this is a very popular space. So uh, just be on the lookout. There, there are a lot of cool companies solving this issue because it is, it is an important issue. So thank you. I hope we have time for a few questions.